Hello and welcome to Unify's webinar on streamlining application performance in NXJ. This is your host, Paula Mellet. We have several people from around the world logging on today, so we want to give those people a little bit more time to log on to WebEx and get all of their audio set up. We'll begin in just one short minute. So a couple of things before we get started today. Uh, for today's webinar, we do encourage questions, so if you have one, please use the Q&A button located on your WebEx toolbar. This is the button with the question mark on top of it. Uh, WebEx also has a chat feature, but we ask that you use the Q&A button because it makes it just a little bit easier for both Kevin and myself to monitor just a single panel to make sure that we get all of your questions answered. Also, today's presenter on NXJ is going to be Kevin McCormick. Now, Kevin has been with Unify for over 15 years in various technical roles. Uh, I believe he's worked in support, consulting. He is my right-hand man in pre-sales and is also our lead trainer for many of our development products, including NXJ. So it's a great opportunity and a real treat to have someone with his background and experience with NXJ presenting today. And with them, I'm going to hand it over to Kevin. Okay, thanks, Paul. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening to all of you around the world. Okay, before we begin, I do want to thank uh, one of our French office persons, Henri, who gave a lot of the material for this presentation. So um, a little shout out to you, Henri. Uh, you're on vacation, so enjoy. So the topic for today's presentation really is going into making your NXJ applications be more streamlined and faster. So basically the whole focus is on the end user experience, whether it's from the client side or from the server side. So to do that, we'll talk about how AJAX is used in NXJ, some thoughts to do on your database performance, make sure you're getting your most there. Then we'll get into most of our time will be spent on properties and coding tips, techniques, thoughts for NXJ. And then finally, we'll wrap that up with a discussion of some of the JBoss server settings for both the standard as well as for standalone JBoss once you deploy your application. And given time, we'll get to a demo at the last slide here. So hopefully you guys have a lot of coffee um, or drink of your choice. And with that, we'll go on, and then we'll go to Q&A for whatever questions you have. Now, NXJ, for those that haven't done it before, haven't used it before, haven't downloaded it, although I see some of you on the attendee list are well-versed NXJ users, NXJ is a development environment for the Java platform with browsers as the end client, but it's an IDE that lets you do things in a 4GL type environment, whereas you have automatic tie-in to databases for a query, insert, update, and delete. Um, form navigation is built-in abilities. And then there are some accelerators we've added to the Java language that make it easier to do things, like working with a session object and getting database queries to work. Also incorporated in NXJ is the ability to author and consume web services. So you can call them and provide them all within the NXJ framework without having to go to external tools. The focus on NXJ truly is about developer productivity and letting the user think about the business case, the, the developer focus on the business case rather than the low level plumbing for getting data, drawing it on the screen, sending the right information to the browser, you get to focus on the business logic rather than just uh, the low-level pieces and parts. So as you'll see, we've won a variety of awards over the years here, and um, as a teaser, we'll be coming out with an updated version of NXJ later on this year, and um, we'll mention some of those items at the end of the presentation. So NXJ was one of the early adopters of AJAX, Asynchronous JavaScript and XML, to make the screen redraws faster and less flashy, less redraw kind of flashy. We did that in a variety of ways. One of the first things you see when you use an NXJ application is when you navigate records or do a search on a form, only the area that has to be redrawn is redrawn, so the field values. If you're using our grid for multiple records, those get, only those areas get redrawn. Nothing else. You don't see a lot of screen refreshes like you do in many web applications. So that's using AJAX behind the scenes. We also do some optimization for things like the tab control, where you may have multiple tabs. In order to get the information to the user faster, we send just the frontmost tab to the browser, 
and then backfill that while the user is on that page so they can immediately interact with it and then continue on. And there's ways you can optimize that further by when the user actually clicks on a secondary tab, go to the database find rather than doing it when they may never visit that tab. Okay, for those of you that have seen other NXJ presentations, this slide's one you've seen before, but it, it shows all the pieces of the form, and so we continue to use it. It describes what you see in an NXJ application that makes it very client-server-like, including data regions, the tab controls, the automatic master detail behavior, the AJAX ability as you do master detail relationships, and the built-in functionality for a query insert, update, and delete. So those are all the functionality of NXJ as well as how we make it so your users don't see the screens flicker and flash as you as they navigate the, their records and update their data. Okay, so let's focus for a moment for optimizing your application, but not doing it from the NXJ side, but more from the database side. We always focus on the 4GL a lot, the the NXJ Java syntax, but frequently that ends up being a crutch for not doing good database queries. Make sure that your database is optimized. So for primary keys and foreign keys, you have the appropriate access methods. So you have hashes and D-trees and direct links depending on what your database supports. You don't want your queries going sequential when they go against your database. That just is going to hurt your performance, and the end result is your end users are going to complain to you that it's slow. When available, assuming your database supports them, use other joins to get multiple table records. Don't do an execute SQL syntax and then do a nesting one beneath it if you can avoid it. That's multiple open cursors. Um, you're going through one result set and the second result set. Let the database do what it's good at. So use other joins when available. The same is true of business logic. If there's some work that you're doing heavy lifting on that can be, be performed in the database, use a stored procedure. Um, it used to be that people would not do that in order to keep their application database independent, but usually customers have chosen a, a database vendor of choice, so use stored procedures. Use the PL SQL for Oracle. Let the database do its job. And that's particularly true when the database is on a separate machine in the application server. Avoid the network traffic. As an example, we have an outer join here from one of our customer applications. This is one of our French ones that Henri had provided. It's using an outer join, or two outer joins in fact, to get customer information, contact information, as well as CRM information in one query. The database is good at that, all the indices are there get the data much faster than having NXJ get the records, then get the contact information, then get the contract information. So as we go through the presentation here, you'll see there's a fair amount of code in this presentation. So I've highlighted the parts that are relevant in red, but uh, so hopefully that makes it easier to see. And we certainly can get you the presentation if you want to review it in more detail. Okay, so now let's go. I've given my little spiel on database optimization. Don't forget it. Let's now go look at properties and code on the NXJ side of things. So we'll look at the properties that you will that you want to look at for performance at both the form and the data view level as well as at the individual field level. Then we'll talk about some coding thoughts of how to make things faster and also a visit to client-side validation, how to keep the work on the browser rather than having to go to the server for a lot of round trips. So at the form and data view properties, there's a few things we want to consider. Field placements, how to work with batch operations, some of the validation commands for client-side processing, and we'll revisit that a little bit later as well. How to limit the records that are retrieved and sent to the browser, and then we're optimizing your memory, or at least uh, keeping memory from being overused on the server side. Field placement. We've seen a lot of customers that will have information they need inside the code. They will place those fields, the target fields or types the database come on the form and mark them as hidden. It's an easy thing to do. It seems like a good idea. You can group them all, make them small, and hide them in the corner. 
But what you're doing, though, is meaning is having NXA have to send that information to the browser, even though it's invisible. Um, the data gets passed to the browser. So ideally, you don't do that. Instead, you declare those in your code, and it's easy enough to do. You use the multi-valued tag, the NXA data type, nullable string variable, nullable numeric variable, and so on. And that causes the next day by the name of the variable to detect that that's a target column and will add it to the select list from the database. So you don't have to place it on the form. The only case that you would have to place the field on the form and mark it hidden is if you're interacting with it in JavaScript, either by setting values or having to retrieve the values through JavaScript because it, the JavaScript in the browser only has access to the items on the browser form. As a side note, and I don't have it on a slide here, make sure to use multi-valued only when necessary. When you're working with scratch variables, usually you don't need a multi-valued variable. That just takes up more memory allocation on the server side. So in classes, we always go through that and have to do a discussion to describe those differences. But watch out for that. At the form level, there's a property, and we'll revisit this when we get to client-side validation, called validation commands. These are the commands that will cause client-side validation to happen. This is a list of commands. Normally, you would do the normal NXJ add update, automatic save command, or you may have custom save or validation commands, or you want to execute on the server. By listing these in this property, you are saying, go check these fields before I make a trip to the server. So, and you can avoid that trip if everything's not correct on those. But we'll revisit this. One possible way to minimize trips to the server is one that not many customers have used, and it can be a little touchy, but if you get it right, it saves the users a lot of time and, feel, and gives them a much better feel for repeating areas. And it's called the batch updates, or the property is really called batch record updates. When a user use, does this, when they toggle between records, clicking them or using up arrow, down arrow, a trip to the server is not made, even if they change the value. Instead, the operations are batched up, they're held in memory, and when you do some other operation, whether it's losing focus to a different data view, doing a form navigation, or executing the save command or some other command, all those operations are sent to the server where they're processed in order, which does mean that your code on the server needs to handle those, and that's where the code snippet here is is that you'll want to add in the on next and on previous record the update current record method to save it actually into the selected set, so into the database if it's tied to one. So if we get time in the demo, we'll walk through that. It's easy enough to set up, and you can tell that the field is just that bit snappy. You don't see the busy cursor for a second while it goes to the server and back. Instead, the user can have a grid behave like a spreadsheet, update values, commit them, and, and in general, they just uh, appreciate that behavior. For limiting the records that both are retrieved and sent to the browser, there's a couple of few properties to deal with this. The first one is the find count property. This controls when NXJ, at the form of the data view level, does a query against your database, how many records does it retrieve from the cursor before it sends the results to the browser. If you set this to a low number, the users get their information back quicker, although the users won't be able to see how many records are total because you haven't basically paused scrolling through the result set. And until they do a next set operation, they'll get the next 100 records, for example. Or they do a last record, in which case we'll finish off the query. So that controls how quickly information is sent back to the user and also limits them waiting for a long time for 10,000 records. And it may be that because of the way you have the order by clause, the users may get their records, the ones they want to see immediately, in which case when they do a previous form or cancel out, that just closes the cursor until you've saved having to go through the rest of those records. So that's a good one to use, particularly if you think the users may do a large query. One tied to that is the client record count. 
if you visualize how the data, how the query happens on the server, that you do a query, the information is stored in memory, the records are stored in memory on the server, the question is that number may be larger than what you want to send to the browser. You control that by the client record count. If that's set to zero, all the records are sent to the browser, and that may be a large number. You can control that by setting the client record count, and frequently you'll set the fine count and client record count to the same number. Now, one thing to note is that if you have client record count and you're using our grid control, that they do the sorting by clicking on the header of a column, then the sort does go back to the server so that it actually sorts them based on the context of uh, all the records, not just the ones in the browser. The final property related to the query and records and how much information is sent to the browser and stored on the server is records in memory. So at what point do, does JBoss, your application server, instead of keeping it all in memory and a lot of users that can grow quickly, does it say, okay, I'm going to flush these to disk and retrieve them that way rather than storing them in memory? A little bit slower, but saves memory on the server. The default is 1,000. You can tweak that and play with that. You'll want to watch your memory usage on the server. So, so some of the form properties to consider. And there's no true hard and fast rule on these. It really depends on the use case, so you'll, you'll want to experiment on these. Note that these are settable from code so that you can, in a test environment, change different settings and see how they feel. <coughs> Okay, at the field level, how do we improve performance and how the application behaves to the user? A couple of things to visit, the immediate property and then the required versus the required for command property. The immediate property is one that's there and some probably wish wasn't there. This is, this property, if it's set, forces the user to stay on the field until they give a value. This is very much client-server-like, where that was accepted behavior. On a character or Windows-based, you can make the user stay there. It's not a web model of making the user stay on the field to enter value. Usually, you validate fields at a bigger operation when you do a submit operation. However, there are times when you, you need a value before you continue. Most frequently, that's when doing things like one drop-down list driving another drop-down list. So you need to actually go to the server, process the value before you continue. So use this sparingly and try and avoid it for most cases, but there will be some where you'll need to set the immediate property and have that before field execute or the on data except when the user changes the value. You'll need to uh, capture that operation immediately now. The default is false for that, so again, only do it when you need to. I'm sorry. In fact, I misspoke there. I'm doing immediate versus required. Let me back up here. Why well, does describe was a required property that forces them to enter it correctly? I was thinking ahead here. The required forces them to enter it immediately and not go forward until they enter a value. So let's go back a slide. I apologize there. Immediate deals with the code execution. So sometimes these will go together. So immediate says, when do we go to the server to execute the code? So do we do the before field as we navigate to the field immediately? Do we do the after field when we leave the field? Do we do the on data except when the user changes the value? In general, if you can wait for those till some later operation, do that rather than saying immediate. And again, immediate does tie into you want to execute those for the drop-down list when one drives the other and so on. So hopefully that makes sense. I didn't confuse you too much by jumping ahead to required as mixing those two together. So again, required forces you to enter value before you leave the field. Try and avoid that except in certain cases. Required for command is the more preferred way to do this. And that says when the user, when you work with that validation command that we talked about at the form level, what fields are checked? If the required, required for command property is set, when the user executes a required for command, uh, one of the validation commands that we set at the form level, then it will validate whether the user's entered a value or not. And we'll talk about that in a little more detail in a few slides further. 
So again, avoid required unless necessary. Use required for a command with the validation command to keep from going to the server, which is the whole goal of many of these properties here. Okay, let's go over a little bit of coding thoughts. The first one is limiting and canceling fines, so keeping the users from hurting themselves. A little discussion on some of the field events of which ones to use or not to use. Um, a brief discussion on string methods that we've encountered from various customers, and then a bit on tracing as well. Okay, you normally don't want to let your users do a freeform database find on their target table. You may have 10,000 or more records. You really don't want them to be able to search all of them. What some customers that we've seen do code-wise is they will let the users do a free-form find and then reject records in the on-find event. That means that the data has to come from the database to the server and then get tossed away. Don't do that if all, at all possible. Let the database handle the filtering. And you can do that in a variety of ways. You can use the field search range property or clear find expressions to have those create the where clause for the, that gets passed to database. Or you can use the higher level SQL optional condition property of the form of the data view. And usually you'll set that in before find. And that gets added on to the end of wherever the rest of the query was. So there are a small example here on the slide is in the before find. If our search view says to only show open records only, we set the optional condition to be the where clause of the open close value is equal to one. That will get added on, sent to the database. The database will filter the records based on that criteria, and only the correct ones will be sent back. Okay. How do you cancel fines, and when do you cancel fines before the user is allowed to do the query? Again, if you have a large table, make sure they enter some values before they get there. The way you do this is to check the properties um, before the find happens. And you can check either the search ranges at the individual field level, and for doing that, you either can hard code the field name, or you can use our field iterator to loop through all the fields on the form and check to see if they have search values. We'll see a code example in a moment. You also can look at the form's SQL where clause in the before find section. If that's empty, they didn't enter any search criteria. And in order to cancel the find, you simply use the reject operation method in the before find, and that will cancel the find operation, and the query will never be sent to the database. And usually you can scold the user gently to enter some more filter information for the data. As I said, you either can check the SQL where clause and parse it, and see if they entered any valid ones, or at the field level, you can check the search ranges. And the example we have here is two parts to it, really. And the first one is, and I'm going to try something here in PowerPoint and see if it'll let me do it here. So I can do a before find, and what we're going to do is do a field iterator object that gets all the field iterators for the form, and we're going to loop through those and call a function to check the values. And we have to call the function because that's the only way we can have a nullable field object. Um, it's just a limitation. You can't construct one in code. So you have to use it as a parameter to a function. So that's our other function here. That's our validate criteria function. So for each record or each field that's on the form, we're passing it to this method that takes in that nullable field, and we're checking the search range values. Um, in this case, we're doing simple validation. If it equals an empty string, they didn't, didn't enter any search criteria. In this case, we'll pass back a Boolean false and just keep looping through all of them until we find something that's valid. Ideally, you would check, do a more thorough checking here. Make sure the user has it figured out so they can enter an ampersand, a percent sign to do a wildcard search. Because I certainly, most users don't know that, but someone who's had some SQL experience or seen it or picked up a tip in Technique from some place may try and get around your limitations by doing that. So you probably want to filter that to keep them from trying to trick you. Okay, at the field event level, there's two ways to capture when a value gets modified on the form. And those are the on data accepts. There's also the when value changes event. 
The on data accept one is the preferred one to use. That only executes when the user changes the value. So that's got to again focus on the field, change the value, and leave the field. And depending on whether we have the immediate property that I described before, we may or may not execute on data accept immediately. It may be deferred to do a bigger form level event. Um, so that's usually what you want to capture. Uh, the other event is when value changes. It, it's the overly enthusiastic event, if you will, in that it executes whenever the value for that field changes. It may be when it, when you do a find operation in the on find section, um, as, a re, as the records are being retrieved, when value changes for each field that has it will execute. Whenever you set the value in code, it will execute the when value changes. As you navigate records, the when value changes event, the field will execute. And that can have side effects you don't expect. In fact, you can get into loops with other fields. One sets one and sets the other one back, and you can get an infinite loops I've seen customers do using when value changes. So unless there's a specific reason to use the when value changes, use the on data accept. No, um, and if necessary, use the other events or specific operations that you know when they're going to execute. So whether it's the on find for each processing each record retrieved from the database, the before record as the user navigates to a record, or as we just talked about, the on data accept event for when the user changes the value interactively. Again, then that's usually what you want to capture. Okay, so string methods. So working with strings. We've seen customers do things what they think is a reasonable approach, and for small cases it is, but we've seen some performance gains when you do large number of operations, when you don't do the normal string concatenation operations. Instead, use a string buffer and do the append method to a string to keep building it rather than the plus equal. In loops, that avoids having to get memory and variable allocations. And that may not matter in a small case, but you're processing a large number of records. That both eats up memory and time. Um, and so if you do a string buffer instead, you can just append to it. Um, we've seen reasonable gains by doing that. Even more importantly, when you're writing that data to a file, so if you're building up a large string, write it out in segments, line at a time, rather than building up one big long um, variable in memory. That saves memory on the server for one thing, and then depending on how you're writing out, that can be buffered so you don't have to wait for the write to complete. Disk operations are slow. So you can, if you can buffer that and let the, the server do it, all the better. We'll see on the next slide, um, in a couple of slides really, is that by using the print stream or print writer class instead of the file output stream, which takes, in, takes bytes instead of a, a string, you can get large performance gains in writing data out to files. Again, that's buffered and writes a string rather than the byte up. So we've seen some good gains. Take the case of a French customer that was doing a lot of heavy processing of records and loops and writing them out to CSV files and so on. Um, if we start from the bottom and the top here, their original one processing 10,000 lines truly took 26 minutes to do. Remember, this is a lot of nested queries and other operations in there, too. By optimizing that with query performance and file operations, using the print writer class, we went down to 130 milliseconds. Going to a print stream, which is even more, uh, sorry, the print writer was faster than print stream. Print stream got down to 300. Print writer got down to 130 milliseconds. So same thing, considerable gains. The screenshot we have below is of a test application that was used to validate this. And what you see is that even doing, and this is not database operation, this is just going through loops. So for 2,000 lines to generate, doing the regular output buffer, it was 23 seconds. Using the, well, that the print stream was 63 milliseconds. Using the print writer was 31 milliseconds. So considerable gains from this specific case here. So things to consider. And if we look at the code, it's a little small print probably for you to see. We just wanted to show the differences in how this was being handled. First off, we're using a regular file output stream in the slow case. We're concatenating the string in a loop. So it's building a new variable. 
and we're writing it out with a um, get using the write statement with the bytes operations. And then the second loop here is for the 2,000 operations. We're concatenating again, building up the variable, and then we're waiting until after that for loop to write it out. So we build this big long string in memory. And then we write it all at once, and that's not buffered, and so we have to wait for it all to finish. So again, that was 23 seconds. 63 milliseconds in this one test case, where we use the print stream, and this time using a string buffer. We just keep appending the values in both cases. Um, and then we finally do the write inside the loop for the 2000. So for each 2000, we do the do a print line, and unless we don't have to do a return because the print line forces a return automatically, write out one at a time, it's buffered, then we can continue on to the next loop without waiting for it to finish. So finally, we do the flush and the close, and that will cause everything, the file to be closed, handle to be closed, and all the data flushed much faster. And you optimize that ever so slightly better by doing a print writer instead, almost virtually identical code, just with slightly more efficient. So this was found by, again, our French um, person, Henri, that had gone and found an even faster way to do this. This is for one of his customers. They were ecstatic. Okay, let's visit client-side validation. How do we keep the operations on the browser for the most amount of times and limit the number of trips to the server and back just to check to make sure the user has entered values as well as simple data validation. We handle client-side validation through a couple of ways. There's properties at the form and field level. We've touched on those briefly. There's some styles that are used to highlight fields that are incorrect or have errors. And then there's some JavaScript validation you can do as well. So at the field level, this is sort of a revisit of what we talked about earlier, but to reinforce it, there is a property called required for command that says when you do a validation command, that bottom property, do, do we care about checking this field? So any field you want to keep and check on the client, set this property. Validation rules is an optional list of JavaScript functions to call in order, assuming they've passed the first test that they've entered the value. The value for the field is passed into the JavaScript function. It does its work, checked however complex that is, and then it can return a true or false to say whether it's valid or not. And then it'll go on to the next function if it's okay to continue. Now, in order to do this, you do have to include a JavaScript library or file that can be in the stack content folder of NXJ. And that can be said at either the field level to include property or at the form level if you're going to reuse them throughout your form. At the form level, there is the validation commands property that says what commands, when executed by a link, a button, a menu choice, do we go check the fields that have that required for command property set? So these all four work in conjunction together. So the two usually most set are the required for command and the validation commands. So this allows you to do some basic checking before you even try and go to the server. So a simple JavaScript function, this just checks to see whether the field is greater than 100. So you'll notice that the field is passed into this function. You must, for JavaScript functions, you have to handle the error messages yourself. So you have to do your own alert messages. Um, you'll see that for the other case, in XJ, you can pop, pop up a message or set a specially named field. So in this case, if processing is to continue, you return true from the function. It'll go on to the next function listed if there's one there. If the value is false, or if you return false, that means that failed validation, in which case the field will be highlighted. Okay, how does this really happen? We walk through the steps here. When a user presses a save button, for example, that does the add update command, and that's listed as a validation command, the client side browser processing will say, that's one of the commands I care about watching for. I will go now go check all the fields that have required for command properties set. Any field that is empty, just purely empty, ignoring any of its values, are highlight are 
highlighted using a specific style called NXJ Error Border Style. You can modify that in your style sheet. Use it as a red outline. And a user, a message will displayed, an alert message displayed saying that not all the required fields have been entered. However, if you have a field on the form named validation error, that pop-up doesn't happen. Instead, that message is put into that field. And that's more of what you see nowadays on web pages. When you don't enter all the values, it doesn't do a dialog box. Instead, it says something at the top of the form and keeps you there. Assuming we pass all the entered values, then the fields that have JavaScript validation commands are checked. Values are passed in one at a time to each of the commands, right? The functions, they're called, they return true or false. And again, you have to do your own alert message if you want to signal to the user what was wrong with the field. Now, just comparing the two output displays, the left side image is showing the message when you haven't entered in a value. The right side one is using the error message field, which again is more common nowadays rather than popping up in an alert box. Okay. When you're working your application, you're trying to figure out what's going on, you're developing, it's common instead of doing the, instead of doing display the message box statements for debugging is to write them out to the server log. Now, in the case of development, that's fine. But make sure you go and comment those out before you deploy to production. We see many customers that will leave those in figuring they might be useful at some point in some time and said they never use them, they fill up the server log, they slow things down. So go comment those out. Make sure that those are commented out. Use a conditional variable before you do print lines. I've seen a variety of ways of handling it. Just make sure you do it. And, and I admit that in our applications here, we've done this as well. So we've bitten, it, bitten that same problem ourselves. Okay. Now, different sides different paths we're going to take here now is talking about JBox specifically and how to optimize the logging that happens into the server log. When you get to a production environment and you have a lot of warnings or debug statements, that log can get full, not full, but large very easily and can take up all of your disk space depending on how much overhead you have for that. So JBox, for better or for worse, is verbose by default. If you download and, and start up a standalone JBoss, there's a lot of information sent to the server log. The JBoss supplied to the next day is better with that. We've disabled and set the levels to be a bit higher um, to keep from getting quite so many, but there's optimizations to, to improve as well. The logging mechanism that we use, the log4j logging system that JBoss uses, you can look at how NXJ sets it up, NXJ JBoss, by looking at the server, JBoss server default configuration directory, the log for JXML file. When you go to your standalone JBoss, you should at least change the org.jboss level, because that's one of the offenders that gets lots of information there. So if we look at another screenshot here, the background server log in the back is a standalone one. You'll notice there's a lot of debug statements there. What you'll want to do is to change the org.jboss one. I'll highlight that one here. So that one, by default, is commented out. So you want to go uncomment out this category and change it at least to an info level rather than the debug level. So that will keep you from getting all those debug statements that make it hard to find real errors as well as take up a lot of space in your server log. Okay. Those who have made NXJ applications and deployed them and have end users that let the application sit on their desktop and they don't use them, they come back and they get a timeout error, you've seen the timeout errors in the server log and it makes it hard to figure out when there are real errors. You have to get rid of that and not get rid of those, but scroll past them and ignore them. The way to filter those timeout errors is to add a filter for org jboss web localhost engine. And you set that to fatal instead of error, and that will keep you from getting those timeout log entries. So in the background here is we have a server log for a timeout. And you'll notice it's that localhost engine class that is 
giving the error. So in the log for J XML file that we're showing in the inner window, that is the same category for that level and saying the priority to fatal. So we won't get those error level messages since fatal is higher up on the logging hierarchy. Um, so that will save a lot of time because inevitably you're gonna get, you normally get a lot of these from a lot of users and it just, again, fills up the log and muddies the water. Okay, how are we doing on time here? Huh? We've been talking for a little bit of time here. Let's go over to the runtime a little bit just to see a few of these things in action and we'll visit the IDE for the batch record processing and then go to Q&A. So I have a few applications running here. I'll go to my start window. Let's go to the validation one because we talked about that most recently. And we have a couple of forms. These are the ones using the screen note. You'll notice that we have a series of fields on the left. Ah, yes, the host here is telling me I need to go share my desktop. Now if I can just figure out how to do this, we'll all be good. Okay, there we go. Okay, we are sharing now. So let's go back to our validation form. So I'm thinking you all can see this now. This is one of the screenshots from the validation command. On the left side, we have a series of fields that are marked for required for a command, and we also have some JavaScript functions to call. If I just press the, press the validate button, notice how fast that was. We get the error message saying you have not supplied values for one or more fields, and they're all highlighted. As we give a value to some of them, the ones that are now valid get unhighlighted, but the remaining one doesn't, and we'll get this value there. And now, you'll notice we now get other messages. So you can have to be over 100. It highlights the field for 1,000. We'll give that to a 1. Go on to the next one. Cannot be over 100. That's our 200. Give that to 99. Yep. So I can't be over 1,000. That's our final one. And also continue on there telling the user that they did 1,000 to 100 and so on. I have a different message, different check on that one. I'll use both commands, less than 1,000, less than 100. Okay, notice now we get to our validation command. We made it to the server. Prior to that, we hadn't made it to the server yet. And these other fields here doesn't matter because we didn't set them to be required for a command. I notice that I did no validation. I can set these to anything I want, and it won't go there because that's not the validation command I have set for the form. So, you know, some things check, some things not check based on what you're wanting to do for the user. Now, if we... Go to the one with the label. It's really the same thing, just you get a message at the top rather than the dialog. So, a little, again, a little more useful for what's happening there. So, we can enter some values. And I'll still give our message. Or once we enter the correct value, we still give our 100 value. And we got to the server. So, that's a validation command. Let's go back over to and find my right window here. I'm going to refresh this one. This probably has caused a timeout in my server log because it's been up for a little bit here. There we go. So this is the performance one, the optimization. So it may not sound like 20 seconds is a long time. It doesn't sound too bad. So if we press the button here, it's going to the server. And we're sitting here waiting while I'm talking for 20 seconds or so. You can imagine to a user, that's a bit of time waiting for, even if they know they have a lot of data and you're writing out to a file for them, you're doing work and it, it makes it seem impressive. But again, 20 seconds or so is a pretty long time here. And again, we're still out there finally, 22 seconds later. So I just filled all the time with uh, talking. Now let's take the first one. Poof, done, 62 seconds, 62 milliseconds. The even more optimized one, 15 milliseconds. So this is where taking a little bit of time and looking at your Java code pays uh, dividends in performance. So if something doesn't seem slow, it may be, and you may be able to optimize it either in the database or through your code. Okay, so let's go over to the IDE for a moment here. We're going to do one thing on batch record processing. 
We'll do batch test. We're going to do a new project. Those are used to the SQL based database. You'll be familiar with this. Make sure that we're up and connected. We will we actually will choose a new base project just to get a better looking form here. Sort of a tease for it's day twelve one. Go back and remove the standard one. And we'll finish it. Now we actually have a library I'm gonna go use a look and feel here that's there. And let's go create a form. And I'm gonna call this form Get the rename going there. We'll rename it. And let's use our database wizard. We're going to do a grid. We're going to do this against our company table. We're going to only choose certain fields here to say real estate. Company ID, company name, address, city, state. And we'll just get all those there and finish it. And we'll stretch this out a bit. We'll just reset our repeating area here. It'll be easier to do it this way. Size our field. And what we want to do, I'm actually going to end up deploying this twice here, because what I want to show is the navigation. Now, one thing I do want to do is add two event sections here, because we'll need these. We said that if you're doing batch record processing, you want to save the record for the user when it's batched. We also probably want to do this for the case we're not batching them. Then if is the current record stored, and in fact if it's not stored, we want to do an update current record method, and that's about it. And we're going to duplicate our code, even though that's not the best practice, but it's easy to do here. We'll do this in on previous. So no matter which way they go, record navigation, they'll be fine. Set the form to auto find. And entry point so we can actually run it. And I am going to go ahead and deploy this. Take this moment for the initial compile here. This is going to be not with, without batch record processing. Copy all of our files, compile and build the war, and then we will uh, be off and running. Compile is done. Create the war, create the ear, and deploy it now. And once that's there. Let's go over open a new tab here. And that's test. And this is customer info form. Oh, oh in fact, this is, this is actually 12.1 that I'm running. One of the new features we'll have in 12.1 is the ability to do horizontal scrolls for the grid. So I'm giving a little bit of a teaser there. So as we execute here, note that the flash of going to the server. A mandate is noticeable on WebEx, but as I modify the zip code, it goes to the server each time. And which is okay, except that there's an ever so slight delay. So if we add values there, notice it refreshed it. And again, it has to go to the server. Let's go change that to batch record processing at the form level, batch record changes. We'll just go and deploy this. Go back to our service, leave our automatic starter up here. Wait for the deploy to finish. And there we go. So relaunch the form. Let's go back over to our zip codes here. Now I can do this much faster because we don't go to the server. And now I press a update goes to the server, and go search them, and they all are modified with my changes. So go refine them. So 
There's not, uh, you can't do this in all cases when you have master detail. You can't use it as a batch one, but in some cases, you're doing spreadsheet kind of operations and users appreciate it. It's just that much faster for them. Okay, so now if I figure out how to get back to WebEx. Oh. Okay, so now, um, that's a basic demo of some of the things we've talked about here. What we have now is if we have any Q&A, any questions. So again, this is your host, Paula Melling, basically just reminding you that if you do uh, have any questions, to so please use the Q&A button marked with the question mark. We'll go ahead and give you a couple of seconds to submit your questions, and Kevin and I will be more than happy to answer them for you. Alrighty. Alrighty. The first question that we have is, what is the current release of NXJ and when is the next release going to be available? So the current release of NXJ is version 12. Right, 12.0C is our most recent. And we do have a, a forthcoming update of NXJ 12 that is scheduled for this calendar year. Right. In that, you'll see new themes, the grid being dynamic, um, support for new style sheets. Uh, for updated style sheet levels, um, and along those lines, probably a few other things as well. Okay, and the next question that we have is, what is the JDK version for next gen? So J JDK right now is 1.5, um, right, um, and we'll support 1.6 in our next version as well, since that's also the current version, so we'll be going to that. Okay, our next question is, is it possible to internationalize using Alert JavaScript? That is a good question there. Yeah, um, the methods that we pop up for the validation commands, absolutely, that can be modified in one of our files to change it. There's a file, and I forget the name of it now, that has all the text messages, and we localize by default for Japanese, um, but that's modifiable, and either a support group or consulting can give you more information on that. The alert messages themselves, if you code them in your JavaScript, um, I suspect, I believe you can get to the locale and have to localize them that way. Okay. The next question we have is, are the sample applications available? Yes, absolutely. Contact uh, your support contact or your sales contact or support, and we can get them to you. Definitely. That's, that's definitely something that we can we can help you out with. So, if there are no further questions, we're going to conclude today's webinar on streamlining application performance in NXJ. If you do have any further questions, uh, please contact your local Unify sales representative, or you can always send an email to info at unify.com. Thank you for your time and have a